Okay, it's 2 p.m. Central European time. Um, welcome back to Common LA. I'm uh, Davide Palita, and today with me, it's going to be Usam Aldas held, handling the uh, question from Zoom. Hello, Usam. Hi, Davide. And Jemima uh, handling the, a question from YouTube. Hi, Jemima. Hi, Davide. So please, if you have questions and you're watching on Zoom, use the QA. Uh, box to ask questions or the uh, live chat on YouTube. Um, today we're going to have uh, our speakers are uh, Julian Hall and Yves Galabova, uh, both from the University of Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Um, uh, Julian is a reader in Edinburgh and Yves is uh, one of uh, his PhD students. And today they're going to talk about height, so high performance software for linear optimization and uh, uh, Julian, the, uh, the stage is yours. If you want to share your screen. Thank you, David. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Um, Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk um, on this Com NLA um, presentation day. Um, what I'm going to do is I will introduce you very briefly to HIES. Um, but then, since this is part of a numerical linear algebra series, I will look at uh, a numerical linear algebra challenge in the simplex method, which um, I hope will be of general interest. Then I'll say rather more about HIES, why we developed it what impact it's had, um, how we can fund it, and what are the academic benefits. And then Yvette will give her insights into the um, being part of HIES. So what is HIES? Um, well, the acronym comes from the names of the people involved, principally, which is me, Yvette, uh, Huang, uh, Ji Huang Fu, and Lucas Shork. Um, <clears throat> there's some pictures of people. Uh, there's two more people who are involved now, Michael Feldmeyer, who is my middle PhD student, and Leona Gottwald um, from Germany. Um, the features of HIES are that it's written in C++. It's got simplex and interior point solvers for linear programming problems, and it's got a branch and bound solver for mixed integer problems. And it's also got interfaces to other languages and systems. It's available under the MIT license, which is the most permissive open source license. It has no third party code, so it's all very self contained. And you can find out more on our website. And the aim of what we're doing is to put together the world's leading open source linear optimization software. <clears throat> so, what is linear programming? Well, if you you may well have studied it at some point. It's a great thing to, uh, to, to teach because you can explain it to anybody, and I mean literally anybody. So the classic problem is uh, where you're, you're trying to decide what to buy and you're wanting to, uh, you know the costs of what you might buy, you know the nutrient information about them and your daily requirements, and you want to choose the, uh, the food to buy, uh, which gives you the cheapest diet. So it's an intuitive problem. And mathematically, the things we don't know, we represent algebraically as x, uh, a vector x with components, one for each food purchased. We can work out the cost of uh, the diet as a linear function of the unknowns and cost data. And for each of the nutrients, we know how much is in each food. And so therefore, we, if we're going to match the daily requirements, we have a, an equation which must hold, linear equation must hold for the decision variables. More abstractly, there's the mathematical form of a linear programming problem and the constraint matrix uh, coefficients, uh, the matrix A has typically in practical problems is sparse and it may well be structured. So that's an old test problem which is clearly sparse. That's the pos positions of the non-zeros in the uh, constraint matrix. 
Here's one from um, an animal feed problem that uh, we've been working on. Again, very small, um, but it's got sparsity and structure. And large scale practical LPs though, may well have 10 to the seven variables and constraints. How we solve them with the simplex algorithm? Well, I'm not gonna explain the algorithm because I want to just get out the essentials of the numerical and your algebra. So at any stage in the algorithm, the indices of our decision variables are partitioned into two sets. Um, we have more variables than equations, otherwise it wouldn't be a very interesting problem. Um, and so we partition our variables into ones that we are solving for with the system of equations and ones that we set to zero. So that gives us a current point in our search space and the algorithm identifies indices to exchange between the sets B and N so that the objective improves. So we're going to a, a new point in the search space with better objective. The way it does that is it requires data, it requires a column of this standard simplex tableau and a row of the standard simplex tableau, and they can be computed from scratch by solving a system of equations with a column from the constraint matrix is the right hand side and solving a system of equations with the transpose of the matrix B with an identity column on the right hand side and then forming a matrix vector product to get the pivotal row. Now, the other feature is that at the end of each iteration, column P of the matrix B is replaced by a vector. And so therefore that's how the matrix of coefficients in our system of equations in one iteration is related to the coefficients of the previous iteration. That really helps to distill out the numerical and the algebra. So the challenge is because we're solving systems of equations, the challenge is to uh, at some point form an LED composition of the matrix B and solve systems of equations with a right hand side which is sparse. That's an in one immediate feature which is perhaps unusual for people who are interested, know more general, uh, work more generally in numerical and linear algebra. The right-hand side is either a column of the constraint matrix or a column of the identity matrix. And then the next thing we want to do is solve for the updated matrix. I'm gonna focus on the interesting parts of solving a single system of equations with a sparse right-hand side. Well, we're doing LED composition with a sparse matrix, which is non-symmetric. So uh, we do that in the LP world with a Markovitz type approach, where we identify uh, rows and columns of Markovitz count zero, uh, row and column singletons, until every active non-zero in the matrix has got a positive Markovitz merit. So that yields a structure like this, which is a triangular, with an, um, a lower triangular matrix L naught here um, from the singleton rows and an upper triangular matrix U naught from the singleton columns. And we can solve that system of equations Bx equals R with that structure by forward substitution to get XL. And we substitute that into the last set of equations. And we have a square system involving the matrix B naught, which we assume we can uh, decompose with Gauss elimination. Um, and then once we've solved for those variables, we've then got a, a backward substitution with the upper triangular matrix U naught from the column singletons. So that's a fairly standard numerical linear algebra process. What makes it interesting in the context of LP is that the matrix B is typically highly reducible. In other words, the dimension of this matrix B naught that's got where every non-zero has mark of its count of at least uh, uh, one, um, that dimension is very much less than the dimension of the system of equations. So if, for example, your particular field is solving partial differential equations, you may just know that your matrix B is completely irreducible. And so therefore, um, the fact that this might be an issue somewhere else is, is just maybe not something you've ever considered. 
But LPs are special things. And in fact, there's a particular class of uh, linear programming problem called a network flow problem, where you can prove that the matrix B is going to be triangularizable completely. In other words, this matrix B naught is vacuous. So in a sense, they're very, very easy systems to solve because they're highly reducible, typically. So where does it get interesting? Well, it gets interesting because the right-hand side is sparse. So we know how to solve um, a system of equations given an LU decomposition. It's a forward solve with the L factor and then a backward solve with the uh, U factor. But in the revised simplex method, the vector R, the right-hand side, is sparse. So what are the consequences of this? Well, if the matrix B is irreducible, then the solution vector X is full. So even if, coming back to your um, PDE example, if your vector R has just got a non-zero in the first position and maybe the last position, then your solution is, is a full vector. And that's kind of what you expect because that's what's going to happen, modulo cancellation. However, if the matrix B is highly irreducible, then the solution of that system of equations can be sparse, which is very unusual. And you won't necessarily come across this every day, but it has some interesting consequences. It's the phenomenon uh, that we called hypersparsity, and you need to exploit it when forming the, the vector x to be computationally efficient, and you then have to exploit it when you're using the vector x. So to look at it, the consequences in a little more detail, here's a basis matrix B for the LP problem I showed you earlier, a problem called STAIR. And if we're going to solve system equations and, and, and see whether the solution might be sparse, uh, it's interesting to look at the inverse of that matrix. And in this case, the inverse of the matrix has got a density of 58%. It's, computationally, you have to assume it's full. And so since even if the right-hand side is sparse, then since the solution is a linear combination of columns of the identity, the inverse, then the solution is typically dense. And that's what you would expect. If you take a random sparse matrix and form its inverse, then it's usually completely full. Where things get interesting, here's an LP problem called PDS2, which is sparse. Uh, it's like sparse matrix. But if you look at the inverse of that matrix, it's got a density of only half a percent. And so if you've got a sparse right-hand side, uh, you're combining a small number of columns from that B inverse. And um, so the result is likely to be sparse. And this is a relatively low dimensional problem. And the bigger the problems, the more this sparsity uh, is evident. So to illustrate a couple of interesting features of hypersparsity, I'm now just going to look at the, at the L solve. So forget simplex or anything. Um, this is just an L solve where the right hand side is sparse and the L matrix has come from the decomposition of one of these um, basis matrices. And then if all, the, all of what I discuss here can be applied to other triangular solves. So the L solve is just forward substitution and you can, in pseudocode, you can represent that as a loop. It loops through all of the columns of L or the, all of the entries of the right-hand side. And it simply subtracts off a multiple of the column of L from the right-hand side, looping through from one to M and then the solution is just the, the, the R vector that you get at the end. Now, when the right-hand side is sparse, that means the vector R initially is sparse. Uh, the, this process is inefficient because most of these entries Rj are going to be zero. And so therefore, you know what the result of Rj minus Lij Rj is when Rj is zero. So it's inefficient to be actually doing it. Eventually, uh, if R fills in, then it becomes more efficient, but um, we can make it more efficient to start with by putting this test for zero. 
all we say is that if the right hand side entry in row J is non zero, then we actually do the um, uh, this vector operation uh, with the column of L. Um, <clears throat> And that avoids you doing operations with zeros, multiplications with zeros and additions with zeros, which is all about exploiting sparsity. However, when the solution itself is sparse, very, very few entries of the right-hand side are ever zero, since the right-hand side morphs from B into the vector X. And in fact, if that is the case, then the dominant cost of that whole operation is the test for zero not the floating point operations. So we need special ways of identifying which of these uh, terms in this loop actually have to be done uh, and not just by testing for um, the right hand side being non-zero. So that's hypersparsity. Uh, more generally, well, in the simplex method, we have um, the solution of a system of equations with the matrix B, we have the solution of a system of equations with the matrix B transposed, and we have the matrix vector product. For the transposed solves, the, um, everything flips from being forward substitution to backward substitution, and it's not so easy to identify uh, how to exploit the zeros that will be in the solution. And it's typically done by storing the L matrix and the U matrix row wise as well as column wise. And then you can do the back the transpose solves using the row wise representation of the LED composition. Matrix vector product you think might think is a very simple animal, and it is in many ways. But if the vector itself is sparse, then if you multiply the vector into each of the columns of this matrix N, it's very inefficient because most of the for most of the time you will get a zero in um, the matrix with that vector pi hitting um, a non-zero in N. So the efficient way of doing that is to store N row wise and just combine the rows corresponding to the non-zeros in the vector. So all this was uh, work which I did with Ken McKinnon quite a long time ago and uh, we applied it right across the simplex algorithm. <clears throat> and got a good performance improvement. So back to highs. Um, why did we do it? Well, it was a legacy of uh, Chi Huang Fu's uh, PhD, which finished in 2013. And we wrote two papers. They were very well received because very few people do research on linear programming in the simplex method. Um, and Chi then went off to work for Express, who's, which is a commercial uh, optimization software company. And he left me his PhD code called HSOL um, to do whatever I wanted with. And it was a very, very fine code because uh, he's a very fine programmer and understood the algorithm. But I could do nothing with it because it was written in C++ and I'm an old man and uh, I could only uh, write Fortran at, those, at that time. And so for about three years, it just sat there and gathering dust um, until Yvette uh, decided she'd like to do a PhD with me. And she added um, what's known as a pre-solve to uh, cheese code, which is a way of getting rid of the rubbish out of, a, uh, of an LP um, that um, doesn't have to be solved for. And that made HSOL more competitive, which was good for a, a consultancy um, relationship that I had, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And then a couple of years later, um, we took the big step that we should try and turn what is just gradware, in other words, PhD uh, student code, into software. And this was done for two real reasons. One was that there was no open sourced LP solver which had got proper support and modern interfaces. Um, and so therefore we perceived a, a, um, a demand externally. And there's also scope for impact. Now, if you're in the UK and uh, in the universities, you know what impact is and you know how valuable it is. And uh, if you're not in the UK, this is, if you can demonstrate socioeconomic impact of your work, 
uh, then it's very, very good, important for funding. But turning gradware into software isn't easy. It's a lot of work. So it may be something that you've thought about doing, but if you're really going to do it well, it is hard and there's a lot to do. Uh, so we manage the software with GitHub. We need documentation. That's fairly straightforward. Um, but we also need uh, build systems to get things to build on different architectures and unit tests to make sure you don't break it and um, continuous integration to make sure that um, you can still uh, solve on, on all architectures. Was, and you really have got to support all architectures because people will just moan at you because it won't work on a Mac. What about impact? Well, the impact actually comes from animal feed formulation um, and that links back to the diet problem that I mentioned earlier. Uh, animal feed is blended from many ingredients and each animal uh, type may have multiple diets according to male or female or young or lactating or whatever. Uh, and all these diets are made with shred raw materials. And so it's um, a multiple diet problem, which has got a, what's known as a Dancy wolf structure as a linear programming problem. And the companies that make animal food are looking to formulate their food at minimum cost. So although the human diet problem is not something we ever solve, uh, this is very much a problem which is solved in industry. And the principal company uh, that we've been involved with is a company called Cargill. And if you're, in, uh, if you're not in America, you may not heard of Car Cargill, but if it was a public company, it would be about the 12th largest in the world. Now, there's a company that originally was British uh, called uh, Format International uh, that I've been working with for 25 years, and they produce software for blending animal food, and their software is now used for blending about half the world's manufactured animal food. Uh, the real high value is in pet food rather than farm food, um, because people are, people are prepared to spend a lot of money on their pets, but not necessarily uh, raising farm animals. And um, the software is also used to allow companies like Cargill to trade commodities because Cargill will require, make use of a very large amount of the world's grain, for example, to produce animal food. So I had a Fortran code that I wrote a long time ago, which Cargill has been using. And um, when we could demonstrate that Hives was 10 times faster than my Fortran code, um, they were very pleased. Uh, they paid us some money. And altogether, we put together an impact case study for the current REF. So is Hi's a company itself? And well, there are times when I feel like I am running a small uh, software company rather than being an academic. Um, and so it opens the question as to whether there is a business model for open source software development. Because everybody loves open source software because it's free, but it requires work to create and that work, time has to be found to do that. And is there a way of funding it is a good question. Well, I've funded our activities two ways via consultancy, um, as I've just mentioned, and that helped Yvette to go part time for two years. And um, I've also used consultancy income to employ a subcontractor to write the integer programming solver. Um, for myself, uh, since I can create impact, um, the school likes that. And so therefore, I've been given time to create more impact for the next ref. And so that's another way of getting time um, paid for by somebody else. It's a question which I'm looking at now, um, whether companies will pay for support of open source code. And it's I've been talking to somebody else who's produced open source optimization software. And it's very hard to get companies to even admit that they're using it, because sometimes someone will in the company will decide to use open source software, but not actually uh, admit to it. And so therefore, getting their company to pay you money is quite a long, uh, long path. Um, but we hope that some of the companies that we can work with, we can uh, encourage them uh, that it's a good idea to pay for support if they're using open source code, 
uh, because they've got a com commercial, um, shall we say, they're exposed commercially if they're using open source code and it's not supported and that might persuade them they should pay us some money to support it. And these are some of the companies who have actually paid us some money. And that takes me to the academic benefits of doing open source. Well, internally, it, HISE has provided a software environment for uh, research by PhD students into computational optimization. Um, means they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time for certain things. And so, for example, my middle PhD student, Michael Feldmeyer, is writing the quadratic programming solver, uh, which will be used in HISE. And if you're producing software where there are external demands on its quality, then that is a driver to uh, the quality of the gradware that's being produced by PhD students if uh, they know it's going to get very well tested. And that should feed back into the quality of the research that they do, um, because they're not dealing with just they're not just dodgy codes that solve a few problems. Um, they are codes which are getting properly tested. There's also an internal benefit of the fact that providing the service of an open source code uh, is raising the profile of our optimization group, uh, and so there's a, there's a value there academically. Externally, well, the scientific community has got better optimization software as a result of what we've been doing. So HISE, for example, is the LP solver in SciPy, which is a, uh, a lot more than just optimization for Python programmers. There's a repository of optimization software for operational research called CoinOR, and uh, HISE appears in there. And there's a Julia-based modeling um, package and optimization um, packages called JUMP and the HISE is available from that. And of course the other benefit of open source software uh, to the community is that other researchers can take the open source code from of HISE and build on it for their own good purposes. So that finishes my part of the talk. Um, I will now hand over to Yvette and Yvette I suggest that you should Hopefully you can share your screen with the same slides unless you want me to. I was hoping you could change the slides for me. Is that okay? okay. Then you will just tell me to, uh, to change slides. Yes. So hi, everyone. I will um, introduce myself briefly now and tell you about my involvement with Heis and Julian. So my um, work with Julian actually started before um, my master's program. I was still a bachelor in the University of Edinburgh and Julian taught me a linear programming course. I loved that and decided I, it would be great to work in optimization. And the first work I did with Julian was actually on nonlinear optimization, but I haven't added it here because this is a talk for LPs and highs. So um, my master's project, I was lucky enough to get to do with Julian as well. And he suggested I do pre-processing for LP in the highest context. And the initial plan was to do pre-solve for half of the summer and advanced basis start for the um, remaining part of the summer. And that turned out to be not the case. I continued working on pre-solve for the first few months of my PhD, and it was very um, challenging for me uh, because of the level of software engineering required. Here, I should say, um, I did a joint degree in computer science previously as well, so I have some experience. Um, but I absolutely fell in love with, um, with optimization and Heist in particular because it's, it's small, it's compact, it's simple, it doesn't rely on anything, and it's really great to be able to contribute to that. Um, so I was lucky enough to get uh, funding for a PhD, which was funded by Google. And Julian had a, has still a relationship and a collaboration with the operations research team in Paris. And they were very interested in what one bit of code of CLP does. Um, CLP, some of you may be familiar with, is another open source solver for linear programming problems. The project was not easy, um, but I managed to work out mostly what the crash is doing. And the author of the crash is called John Forrest. He implemented it in PhD. 
in, a, in a CLP, sorry, and called it the idiot crash because it's somewhat not very smart, according to his comments. On the picture, you see an illustration of how the crash is intended to work. So in the middle of the quadrant, you see the feasible region and X star is the optimal point and standard feasibility crashes may get um, to the point XC uh, because they don't take into consideration the objective value of the LP. The idiot crash is intended to take the objective value into consideration and make a guess for where the optimal solution is, which may be on the other side of the feasible region. So you see XB, uh, which is supposed to be the guess. The idiot crash works great on some problems which are very difficult, like the quadratic assignment linearization problems. And this is what makes it so interesting for not only Google, but also the community, since that other people have, uh, have looked into it previously. So this was the start of my, uh, my work with Julian a few years ago. And um, I have been, I have taken longer than most people because of the consultancy. So Julian, if you would change the slide now, that would be great. So, um, so I can tell you a bit about the consultancy as well. It's been very exciting working with Julian. He mentioned Cargill, who are one of the uh, large customers or clients that Julian has. And I got to do a project for them as well for um, mixed integer programming pre-solve and um, well, my pre-solve as well, the highest pre-solve, I mean. So we got to go on a trip to Minneapolis um, to talk to representatives of the company. Another major client of Julian's is Entity Data Mathematical Systems in Tokyo. They are a small mathematical consultancy company who are um, kind of consulting a very large Japanese telecom. So even though the company itself is small, the scale of their problems is pretty large. And it was amazing to have an opportunity to um, present my work to them and uh, participate in the following discussions. So I love being involved in exciting new projects. Um, it's challenging but uh, rewarding definitely and um, there is a sacrifice and that's the, the time one has for research um, but uh, with good enough time management it is possible to do both uh, so that's I mean briefly my consultancy involvement and I'll tell you a little bit about the current work we're doing Julian so we've been working hard preparing for the first release of HIS. As Julian mentioned previously, it's not, it's not an easy task converting a bit of code that a student wrote, a very good bit of code, into a product that's usable by many people on many platforms. Um, there are good integrations with existing software, but for, for more details, uh, we'll forward you to our webpage with the upcoming release information. Um, and research-wise, my work on Idiot Crash continued the idiot crash is an, it's an iterative procedure where in each iteration, there is a quadratic subproblem that's being solved. And in the original implementation of the idiot crash, this quadratic subproblem is solved approximately, but it's not a very good approximation. So we have been experimenting with exact solution of that subproblem, which is slow, but valuable for for making sure the theory holds and um, has scope for improvement if we make the uh, minimization of the subproblem still approximate but a better approximation so kind of an intermediate step between an exact solution which is exact yet time consuming and a poor approximate solution which is very fast this is something i forgot to mention the did crash is very fast so it makes a guess very quickly and in some cases it turns out to be great and um, i have uh, i have plans to experiment with adding a proximal term so modifying the the subproblem and um, I won't bore you with any more details of the current work. So if Julian would change the slide. Yeah, so I'll just round off. Oh, so I was hoping that I felt sorry about that. Highs is um, software suite of opt linear optimization um, codes for solving LP and mixed integer programming. Um, and soon to be quadratic programming. 
Um, it's been a very valuable platform for both research and consultancy. We've demonstrated we can create impact with it, which is great. Uh, it can be used from other languages apart from C++, and it can also be used from packages like SciPy and Julia Opt. Um, it's very easy, free to use um, uh, due to the fact it's based on the MIT license and it contains no third party code. And uh, it just builds very much more easily than some open source software I could name. Okay, so we're happy to take questions from you. Um, and there's some references to the, uh, the four major articles uh, relating to our work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Yvette, for this very nice talk. We even have some insight about, about managing um, uh, open software. That's great. We thank you for that. Um, questions? Uh, Jemima, any questions from YouTube? No, not at the moment. I think they're just catching up. No. I see. And Usam, question from Zoom? No, there isn't. Okay, uh, then uh, we thank you. Uh, Can I ask a question? question? Sorry. Sure. Yeah. Um, so maybe a more mathematical question first. One of the things you were mentioning, Julian, was that um, that you have you're interested in sparse problems where the inverse is also sparse, um, and that this is like a smaller class of problems than just sparse matrices. So is there a way of saying in advance? whether you expect sparsity in the inverse or is it kind of experience or? It's, it's mainly a question of experience. Um, linear programming problems are used to model all sorts of situations, but where you've got things happening on a network, um, you've got net, what's called network structure. It, and practically it might mean that it's a logistics problem or something like that then you can start to say that that might be hypersparse, but it tends to be, it tends to be something which a particular practitioner would identify quite quickly that their type of problem is hypersparse. And so therefore should they should, it, it, simplex is a good way of solving it. Otherwise they should use interior point. Right, that makes sense. Um, and then an, a question more on the kind of software development side. Um, so I've had experience of, well, I guess most of us have of being in groups where you inherit code from previous PhD students or postdocs, and it's not always well documented or, you know, many of the problems you were discussing. Um, do you think there's value to doing open source code for something that maybe has less commercial application? Um, or do you think you really need the commercial investment to make it worth the time and effort to, to make it open source longer term? I think the short answer probably is yes, um, unless you're going to bring money in or somebody's not got a life uh, or more than one pe person has not got a life and is prepared to spend hours and hours of their spare time uh, turning this into software in the hope that it gets used by, it fuels maybe collaboration with other academics, um, the feedback is not quite so obvious. Um, I'm well aware that I've got, we've got kind of lucky here that it's, it's a hugely used um, class of problem, uh, linear programming and mixed integer programming. And so there's a potential huge market for people wanting to use it uh, either for free or, or with QDOS or, or paying money for, for, for using it. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a good, it's a nice thing to, um, to feel that your code is well documented and can be used and will have a life beyond you. Um, and sometimes you do get a valuable sort of handover from one generation of PhD students to the next that way, but often it's just personal satisfaction and it ends up not being very useful. Yeah. And the, perhaps the other thing to say is that there are packages which are open source, which have been developed over years and years and years. And unless somebody has put a lot of work in to make them easily maintainable, it's probably a nightmare for PhD students or postdocs or whatever to take them on and, 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 and advance them. 
um, if they're not properly engineered. And thankfully, ours is. Thanks for that. Thank you, Juliet. I um I would like to add that there there is a very good book on the matter. It's called The Mythical Man Month. It's written by I think someone with in IBM. Um, it's about scaling of software and scalability. They are big fans of small small atomic teams. So the high team has been great for that. And uh, um, they estimate it's nine times more work to have a pro systems programming product. So a bit of software that's integrated with, well within its systems and that's well tested and documented for the user. So each of these system and user aspects um, are three times more the previous amount of work in estimation on average. Okay, Ustam, I think we have a question. Yes, uh, we have a question from Cleve Moller. Uh, he's asking, are you familiar with sparse blasts? I know there are sparse blasts, but I have, and I have tried to do experiments with sort of general uh, numerical linear algebra, sparse numerical linear algebra code, but the extent of the sparsity in LP typically is so extreme that they're just not efficient enough. You really have got to have it um, kind of hand coded. Um, I mean, there are realities of solving LPs that like the solution of a system of equations is sparse, which just don't apply in general. And so therefore general sparse code is not gonna be, uh, it's just gonna be too inefficient. You really have got to line, write every line yourself. Okay. Uh, That's an example. Just... example, actually, I, I, I have tried to use mumps, which Mump. is a parallel sparse uh, LED decomposition code. And I spent an afternoon with Patrick Amistoy until eventually he realized that your, your, L, your, your matrices are almost completely irreducible. Mumps is not going to help you uh, mm -hmm. because it's designed for reduce, uh, generally irreducible systems. Yeah. So that's the sort of conversation I've had with people who write extremely fine software for certain applications. Okay. So you're just mentioning that there is a session today at Time CSE on uh, sparse. Well, I think it's uh, it's about graph blasts. I think. Uh, so yeah. Okay. He's saying that the key is data structure. Um, uh, Probably there is something I, I would like to ask you about. Have you ever tried to uh, uh, think of um, uh, task-based implementations, which what what Cleve is mentioning here uh, about the structure of data? In task parallelism. Yes, task-based parallelism. I mean, there is there's a. There's a fairly coarse task parallelism in highs where individual system solves are run in serial, but you can, you, you've got more than one that you have to do at once. So therefore you've got task parallelism yeah. allowing it to be overlapped. But this looks like it's task par parallelism within, so shall we say a single solve. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what graph blas are, if it's, Blas for elimination digra uh, digraphs and uh, elimination trees and things like that. It's possible that there's something for me to, for me to learn, um, but it could also be that the sort of the density of the graphs in in LP uh, elimination trees is just not high enough uh, because they are so so sparse. But I, I'd certainly be interested to find out more. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again, Julian and Yvette. Um, I believe the discussion can continue like in a few minutes on Gutter. Um, before that, I'd like to uh, talk about our schedule, like a few words. You know, now we're going to um, meet every uh, other Monday. Uh, but so we were supposed to meet uh, to have another 
uh, common LA on uh, March 15, but that's not going to happen because of the GAM annual meeting. And so we're going to meet on March 29 and we're going to talk about startups and spin out companies. So um, we're now moving uh, to gather for like further discussion and see you there. Thank you.